Good morning. Welcome to Forest Chapel. We are a small group today, but I have a feeling we are mighty, or where two or three are gathered. And I'd like to wish everybody a happy Mother's Day. Um, if you've never read anything by or heard anything by Max Lucado, I encourage you to. He's really good. He says this about mothers. He says that mothers are incredible creations of God. They give birth to tiny humans, and then they spend their lives pouring into them until their last breath. They carry diaper bags, bottles, lunch boxes. They carry books and band-aids, and they gracefully carry their children's burdens. We wouldn't be here without them, and we certainly don't want to be. Moms are valuable to God, not because of the many things that they do, but because they love like God loves. They speak the language of hugs and forgiveness, of cheering us on and keeping us in line. Moms, always remember that you matter to your family and that you matter to your Heavenly Father. So to all the moms today here in the sanctuary and the moms worshiping online as well, happy Mother's Day. And happy Sunday to everybody. We do have a few announcements. Okay, so today is Pastor Kabamba's last day out of town. So you can see the At the Forest uh, for more details. She finished her service with Judicial Council and General Conference last week. Um, so she's currently in Michigan officiating the funeral of a dear friend. And today we have a sermon, sermon prepared by our friend Nathan Spencer. So Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today, for taking time away from your kids' soccer in Lebanon and Mother's Day and all that, and thank you for sharing the gospel with us today. Welcome back. We have one more week of the Hold On Bible Study. And this past week, they talked about hope and how keeping our eyes looking forward towards the things God has promised is a critical part of our Christian faith. So please feel free to join us as we wrap up this journey. Our last meeting is this Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the parlor. The Village at Forest Chapel mentoring program will be starting soon. So the wonderful Brittany Jackson has been hired to lead this program and she's been working very hard making preparations. Uh, this starts May 14th, so that's this week. It's open to kid, kids aged five to 12. Some kids will come looking for homework help. Some just need a positive influence in their lives. So pray about that if you're interested. There are sign-up sheets out, or they will be out very soon. And um, that way Brittany can kind of match up your profile with the children. So. Please pray about this and consider becoming a mentor. And then finally, the pamphlets were out last week as you walk in the sanctuary doors and they're out again this week. A uh, pastor is encouraging us to take this and use it in our prayers in preparation for the upcoming spiritual revival happening on June the 8th. So if you haven't gotten one of these, pick one up, read it, and pray about it. Does anybody else have an announcement this morning? Any joys or concerns that you'd like to share? I do have one here from Raj and Lassam. So we have been asked to share this prayer request. Um, they're the leaders of the 12 o'clock noon service and they're currently looking to buy a house. So they need more space for their growing family their current apartment is on the third floor, and it's real hard for Lasang's mother to get up those stairs. So if you or anyone you know is looking to sell their house in the near future, please reach out to Lasang. And regardless, please keep her and Raj in your prayers as they navigate this difficult current housing market. Any other joys or concerns?
All right. We'll say a prayer for those before we go right into the opening hymn. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings and the joys that we experience this week. We also come to you with our concerns, even if they're just in our hearts and not shared out loud. We trust in your power, Lord, to help those who are suffering and strengthen those who are weak. Help us to lean on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join in our opening hymn, He Leadeth Me, number 128. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Our opening song is in Christ alone. Please feel free to jump in and sing along. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are stilled when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, 
fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I lay no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Amen to that. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning joyful again for one more day. We come, Father, honoring mothers, those that are here and those that have passed on. We ask, O oh God, your continued guidance upon us. Keep this chapel safe, strong in your love. We look around this morning and there's not many that are here, but we look upon today as different from yesterday. And when I speak of yesterday, I'm speaking of our generation. For back then, the, there was two times in the year that you could always count on the church being filled, and that was on Easter Sunday and Mother's Day. You have to leave early if you wanted to get a, a good seat. Because when you got there, you look around and you say, where in the world all these people came from? They, they're not members here. The members don't have any place to sit because the unchurched is there. And today, we don't have that problem. Because somehow, Father, we've gone astray in raising the next generation and that generation. But we know that you abide. We know that as long as we look unto the hills from which cometh our strength, we know, Father, where our strength comes from. We know, Father, that you are there with us. And so my earnest prayer this morning, as I look around, is not only this church, but every church. Father, help us to get to the unchurched. Help us, Father, to be able to reach them so that we may see once again your church is filled your church is filled and most of all your people are filled with love 
Teach us, Father. Teach us how to love one another as you have loved us. These and all blessings we do ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I could see my dad while that music was played. He was sitting right there. His eyes were closed. His lips were moving as he prayed. That, you know, some people feel closest to God when they're outside in nature. And some people feel closest to God when they're around lots of family. And some people feel closest to him when they're just all by themselves in prayer. And some people feel closest to God when they experience beautiful worship music like we just listened to. Thank you. We're going to read from God's holy word, but before we do, let us first pray. Heavenly Father, help us to hear your holy words carefully this morning. And help us to understand them completely. Help us to believe them without a hint of doubt. Help us to remember them and act on them in the days ahead. And help us, Father, to praise you in the good times when it's easy but also in the hard times when it's not. And Father, anoint Nathan with wisdom and strength as he speaks to us. Thank you for his faithful spirit. And thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. Today we're going to hear from the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter, verses 6 through 19. If you are able, please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. No problem. I just had a mild heart attack, so that's good. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it just says 16, but it's... Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The 
the word of God with the people of God. You may be seated. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome back to Forest Chapel, Nathan Spencer. Thank you. It, uh, it is always a blessing and a privilege to, uh, to get to come home and to, to join you all. Uh, and I do mean that. It is a, a, a blessing. You know, obviously it's good to, uh, to be here in this beautiful building. Um, the music was fantastic. What a blessing uh, that is. Um, but really, you all are the blessing. Uh, it, it's uh, my joy to see your faces uh, when I'm here. Um, and, and I know that is true uh, every week that I'm not here as well. I think we can uh, fall into this sense of, I don't know if it matters if I show up or not, right? Um, but it does. Uh, and, and you are a, a blessing uh, to this church body. Uh, and, and I'm just uh, thankful for the opportunity to get to join you again. Happy Mother's Day uh, to the moms that are here, the moms that are, are joining us online. Uh, my wife and the mother of uh, our five children is chasing kids around uh, as we speak, I'm sure, in uh, Lebanon at a soccer tournament. Um, so, uh, you know, just uh, utter, utter chaos, I'm sure, that she's dealing with. Um, and here I am. So, uh, you know, I attended a, a work outing uh, not too long ago with those five uh, kids of mine and my wife. It's just my coworkers and families getting together at a, a local restaurant. And like I said, all seven of us, we brought the entire Spencer crew. And I'm not going to lie, I was a little nervous heading into it. Like I'm about to uh, bring the chaos that is my family and just lay it bare before my coworkers. Are we, are we sure about this? I must have been quite confident in my job security uh, to pull a move like that. But everything went fine. The event was great. We got out of there without my kids revealing too many of our dark secrets to my work colleagues. In fact, their antics uh, provided some entertaining work chatter back in the office the following morning. I did have to apologize for my uh, younger ones who were, unbeknownst to me, drinking everyone else's drinks when we weren't looking. Apparently, we don't allow our children to drink anything in our home. Um, I guess that's one of our dark secrets. But like I said, I was a little uneasy heading into that gathering. There's something about seeing people interact with their family that kind of pulls the curtain back a little bit. It, it reveals a little more of who they are. Like if you're not used to seeing them in that setting, it shows you a, a different side of them, a different aspect of their character. Now sometimes it reveals some things that are maybe a little ugly. Or maybe it's the flip side. Maybe their character shines around their family. But it's almost like a, a behind-the-scenes look at just another layer of who they really are. And in our passage today, we get that behind-the-scenes look at Jesus and his intimate relationship with his Father. It's a, a peek behind the curtain. And through this prayer that we witness in chapter 17... The Gospel of John, often referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer, we see Jesus' heart for his people to experience and reflect God's glory. We see Jesus' heart for his people to experience and reflect God's glory. Now, anytime we're in the Gospel of John, I think it's helpful, maybe counterintuitive, but helpful to start near the end, verse 31 of chapter 20. It's near the very end of the book. John tells the reader, straightforward, this is why I wrote this gospel. What's the reason? Let's look at the verse. It says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There it is. He wants the reader to believe that Jesus really is who he says he is, and that through that belief, the believer would have life in Jesus' name, real life as it's meant to be lived. In fact, that's why he starts his gospel account in chapter 1 by saying that Jesus, referred to as the Word, was with God. And the Word was God. So into eternity passed and, and everything was made through him. And 
In him was life, which brings light to all mankind, and that Jesus, the word, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. He's saying, I've seen Jesus, I know who he is, and I want you to believe this account because knowing Jesus will bring you life. So that's why he writes the book. And with that, let's look at the context of uh, our passage today. Now we're getting close to the end of Jesus's earthly life at this point in the Gospel of John. This is the night before his crucifixion. He and the disciples have withdrawn to an upper room at a home in Jerusalem where they're observing Passover. This is the Last Supper. And this chapter is right in the middle of what is called the Upper Room Discourse. So Jesus is spending his final hours with his disciples. And in chapter 16, he's just reminded his disciples yet again that he will be leaving them. Now, he repeatedly reassured them then that it's better that way, that he would be sending the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would empower these disciples to do things without him that they never thought possible. He would use them to build his kingdom and that they would have peace and that he would come back for them. And even though he assured them of all these things, they still were not quite getting it. They're still confused, perhaps a bit unsettled. And with that background, we pick up in chapter 17 where Jesus continues to prepare himself and his disciples for what's about to happen. And he prepares them by praying. In verses 1 through 5, he prays for himself, and we see his heart for his Father. In verses 20 to 26, he prays for all future believers, including you and me. And in our passage today, verses 6 to 19, he prays specifically for his own, for his disciples, for his followers, showing us his heart for his people. Now, there's two things I think he's doing here. One, he's obviously praying for them. Right, But the other is, as he's preparing his disciples for his imminent departure, he is demonstrating to them how to have a conversation with God when things are hard. Prayer is that simple, really. We can complicate it at times, but that's what it boils down to, a conversation, talking to and listening to or receiving from God we bring our thoughts, our feelings, our questions, our struggles to him. He gives us access to himself and he hears us. Psalm 62 describes prayer as pouring out our hearts to God. What a great description of what we see Jesus doing here in this passage. He is pouring out his heart to God. So he prays for his disciples in verses 6 through 19. He reveals his protective heart for his own. He prays primarily for three things. First, for God's work in the disciples' lives. Second, he prays for their spiritual protection. And third, he prays that the disciples would be a sanctifying influence in the world. There's the outline. Verse 6, Jesus prays, I have revealed to those, or I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. That phrase, those whom you gave me, are the Father's gift to Jesus. And somewhat surprisingly, Jesus says of them, they have obeyed your word. Verse 8 explains this. He says, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. To obey God's word, the gospel, means to believe it. It's faith, after all, that saves us, not our own merit. And despite all their shortcomings, the disciples believed. And he holds them dear in his heart. Verse 9, he says, I pray for them. He says, for those who have turned their hearts to him and received his word in faith. That's who this prayer is for. And he's clear, it's not for the world. It's for those who believe in me, those who have received and believed the word in the next verse, verse 10, it says, And glory has come to me through them. Now how can this be? Christ is glorified through these broken disciples? How? 
I could see Christ being glorified through the miracles that he's performed and that John has recorded. He's glorified by his uh, loving sacrifice. But these guys, who don't have the most impressive track record when it comes to understanding who Jesus is or what his ministry is really all about, they miss the mark repeatedly. How then do they bring him glory? Well, I think it's helpful here to define glory. God's glory is the full summation of all of his attributes, the the summation or the adding up of all of who he is, his character, holy, perfect, merciful, almighty, just, faithful, loving, all of those and more in some. And so to glorify means to reveal one or more of his attributes, to, to make them known, to worship him for them, to see or reveal all who he truly is. Now, a couple years ago, I was co-leading a children's Bible study, and the other leader was teaching our uh, elementary-aged students about this concept of God's glory. So we started handing out many flashlights to each kid, and each of these flashlights was labeled uh, love or righteousness or uh, sovereign, accessible, perfect, on and on down the list of the attributes of God. And the kids are shining these flashlights around in a, a dark room, right, on the, on the walls, out the windows. They were really all just shining them right in each other's eyes from like point blank range. But there were dollar store flashlights, so no one's burning anyone's retinas. But the leader told them to shine all of their lights at this one particular point on the ceiling. And as these dim beams of light came to focus on the ceiling, one after another, the spot got brighter and brighter until it was shining bright with the collective light of all of these flashlights. And the leader told the kids, this is what God's glory is like. It's the summation, the adding up of all of his attributes, his character. Now, maybe you've seen that illustration before. I hadn't, so I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. But effective at demonstrating what God's glory, his radiant glory is like. So how has glory come to Jesus through these disciples who are well-documented screw-ups to this point in the story? Well, if glory is the display of the attributes of God, as we surrender to his will, one of the things that happens is that his Character, thoughts, words, actions, they start to be revealed in us. And that is what has at least started to happen with these disciples. They're following Jesus. They're yielding control of their lives to him. And Christ is in the process of sanctifying them, making them more like himself, making them more holy. And the same is true of us. His glory displayed in and through our broken but restored souls. And Jesus longs for his people to experience and reflect God's glory. Listen to his heart as he lays out his petitions now, starting in verse 11. I'll remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is going to the Father. The trouble is the disciples will still be in the world. Now it can be difficult at times to pick up on emotion just through text. Written words don't always adequately convey the feeling or the heart behind what's typed or written out. Just ask my wife, she'll share all her frustrations with my poorly worded, sometimes sarcastic text messages. But it can be difficult in the biblical text as well. Maybe you can read this as a very measured, quiet, reserved prayer. But as I studied this, it felt more like a passionate plea to me. I have protected them, Father, and I'm leaving. They need you. They need you. Protect them by the power of your name. 
And in the Bible, names are important. They represent identity, who someone is. The Father's name represents all who God is. Protect them, Father, with everything you are. By the power of your name, protect them. Now, my family actually just this year walked through a verse-by-verse study of the entire Gospel of John. And when we came to this prayer, I read this with my kids, and as Jesus is pouring out his heart to the Father, asking for the protection of his disciples, I asked them rhetorically, do you think Jesus loved his disciples? My eight-year-old said, Dad, that's a dumb question. (laughs) Fair enough. Verse 14, Jesus notes that believers' identity is no longer with the world, but with him. They are not of the world any more than I am of the world, he says, which signals that they are on the road toward complete identity transformation. And while they're not of the world, they're staying in it. Look at verse 15. My prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. Instead of uh, praying that they'd be taken out of the world, Jesus prays that they would be kept, that they would be protected by the power of God. Now, I think that there is a distorted version of faith in Jesus that seeks to remove itself completely from the world. A A warped Christianity, perhaps, that believes that isolation is the only way to avoid being corrupted by the influence of the world. And it often is manifested in the things that it prohibits. No joking, no dancing, definitely no rap music. I think there's a place for guardrails where appropriate. That's wise. And the goal is a good one, to keep yourself from being corrupted by the sin of the world. But I see two problems with this way of thinking. First, You can't isolate yourself from the sin of your own heart. That's not going to happen on this side of eternity. But second, if you remove yourself from the world, you lose your witness. Think about it. God, the Son, Jesus here, leaves the world and sends the Holy Spirit so that you and I can tell others about him. He just taught on that in chapter 16. We study his word We uh, gather on Sunday mornings, at times throughout the week. We pray, we worship, and what a colossal miss if you and I then just sit around in the church building with each other. One pastor says this, the goal is not to disinfect Christians and put them on a shelf, but to disciple them and put them into service. Like in the actual real world. We're not meant to be an inward facing people. Now, don't get me wrong, community is crucial in our walk with Jesus. But it's all intended to support us as we represent Jesus to a world that doesn't know him. And we can't do that without connecting with them, with the world. Maybe you say, well, I'm, I'm holy, Nathan. I'm, I'm set apart. Well, you're not more holy than Jesus. And his ministry was spent rubbing shoulders with the world. Now, I'm not saying tuck your kids in at night or tuck in your grandkids and uh, go hit the club or run up a, a tab at the local bar. But some of us don't have close friendships with people who don't think or look like us. So think about this. Do you know people outside the church? Are you engaged actively in their lives? Do you only speak Christianese or can you speak at least some of the language of the culture. This, I will admit, is is convicting for me as I look at my social circles. So Jesus knows that these disciples are, are going out into the world, a world that hates them because they are not of this world. So he prays for their protection. Now third, Jesus prays for his disciples to be sanctified, to be a sanctifying influence in the world. He wanted them and us to be in the world, but not shaped by it. He wanted to sanctify us, to make us holy and set apart, 
And how do we develop a heart growing in holiness while we live in this broken world? Well, he says it. Sanctified by God's word. It's by knowing truth, by knowing God's word. Our growth and our walk with Christ or the vibrancy of our kids or grandkids' faith is not going to be determined by how well we avoid or isolate ourselves from lies. It's in how much we know the truth. We can't hide from lies completely. The enemy is too crafty for that. But the way we can combat those lies is by internalizing God's truth. It was uh, a great encouragement to me to open uh, the bulletin or the program this morning and see uh, a week's worth of uh, Bible study prompts. Is that 2 Samuel? I think. That's it. Internalizing. Studying God's truth. That's how we combat the lies and grow in holiness. In chapter 16, Jesus has just talked about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit helps believers see the truth of Jesus and the lies of the world. That's his protection that he's praying for. That's his sanctifying influence in this world. And that's what Jesus is praying over his disciples. He protects and he sanctifies those who put their faith in him. So Jesus pulls back the curtain for us this week. He pulls back the curtain and lets us in on his conversation with the Father. We see that intimate relationship. He pulls back the curtain and reveals a a heart that genuinely desires for his people to experience and reflect God's glory. And in the days following this conversation with his disciples, Jesus is going to tear that curtain in half. He's going to tear it down for good that we may know and worship our truly accessible God. Through his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection, Jesus removes the barrier between us and God, making a way for us to know him. That's why John wrote this book. He wrote this book so that we may believe and have life in Jesus' name. Now, in Colossians 1, Paul echoes John's words from chapter 1 when he reminds us that all things are made by and through and for Jesus. That includes us. So when John says that we may have life in Jesus' name and we recall that we are made by him and for him, we can start to piece together why John is trying to convince us that Jesus is who he says he is and he is where true life, abundant life is to be found. It's because that's what we were created for. If I am made by Jesus and for Jesus, then I'm not going to find true satisfaction in anything else. I wasn't made by my job for my job. I wasn't made uh, by my wife for my wife or by my kids for my kids. I wasn't made by my retirement fund for my retirement fund. So when I'm tempted to go to those things because I'm believing lies, I'm believing the message that I'm receiving that those will bring me lasting satisfaction or purpose, what John is doing is he is, he is standing, he is jumping he's doing backflips off of his soapbox trying to get our attention telling us those are lies and that God's word has truth for us what grace that God shows us in this we're not going to find lasting satisfaction in any of those things that's John's entire point he's sending us a lifeline that's what this book this gospel account is. It's a, a lifeline intended to save us from a lifetime of searching for meaning, satisfaction, belonging, and things that were never intended to serve that role. Life in Jesus, in his name, that's what's going to satisfy me because that's what I was created for. Jesus' prayer for his disciples, for his followers, which by extension includes both you and I, his prayer for God's work and for protection and for sanctification all boils down to this. Know Jesus and find life in his name. 
He gives us everything we need to live life in his name and to willingly make every sacrifice that he calls us to make. He's glorified in our spirit-led obedience and our steadfast suffering, all made possible by our surrender to him. Our willingness to yield control to the Lord. So in what areas of your life are you struggling to do that? What's keeping you from coming to the Lord, repenting, and asking him to give you the power to truly live for him, to truly love him? Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your truth, for the truth of your word, Uh, Jesus, for your uh, heart for us. For your followers, your desire to protect us, uh, Spirit, we, we thank you that you empower us uh, to, to live out this call, uh, to be uh, in the world and not of the world. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for that. Uh, we pray that we would, uh, we would surrender. We would surrender to that call that you have, uh, you have laid before each of us. That your love would shine through us. And that in that you're glorified, Lord. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Even though we have missed Pastor Kabamba... And we look forward with anxious anticipation to her return. I think we can all agree that we have been blessed these last few weeks with messages prepared by Liz Chapman and by Kelly Surrett and today by Nathan Spencer. God is so good. Thank you. Lord, we surrender to you this morning. Come into our hearts. We say yes to you today. For Jenny and Jack Hoffman, as Jenny continues to heal and as they adjust to their new home and search for a church near them, in your mercy, Lord. For tired young moms, older lonely moms, and all the moms in between, in your mercy, Lord. For unbelievers, those that, like Nathan just mentioned, don't speak Christianese, Father, help us to do our part to show them how good you are. In your mercy, Lord. And for Nathan and his wife, as they raise those five precious children to know you. In your mercy, Lord. And now if the ushers would, I'm sorry. Now let us pray that very special prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples and to us. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now if the ushers would come for the... Is this working? Okay. Father, help us to remember how much you have given to us and to give back generously to you. Um, May all that we give this morning further your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name.
please join in our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory, number 98. We'll sing one verse. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. You may be seated. Now go forth into the world. Be willing to show the world the love of Christ, the light of Christ, and the peace of Christ. Remember that we are pilgrims on a journey, passing through, and that this is not our home. Bless someone today. Love someone today. If your mom is still with us, Talk with her today. If she's not, remember her today. As you go forth, be willing to share your faith, if not by your words, then by your actions and your attitudes. Now go forth with light and love and hope and peace, remembering that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Go forth and share Christ. Thank you.